Open your Bibles, if you would, to Romans chapter 6. The title of uh, this morning's message is The Behavior of the Believer. The Behavior of the Believer. And this is something that's, uh, that's been weighing on me for a long time. Just uh, feel like I, I, this is a great transition message between now and between we get into our new series on the topic of uh, reaching people for Christ. But the behavior of the believer is, uh, is waning. We are not doing what we ought to do as Christians ought to do it. My children are, uh, are pretty good kids. They, uh, they're not angels, but I love them to death, and, uh, and I think that they're, I pray that they turn out just loving the Lord and serving Him, and I look forward to maybe even years in the future ministering with them in this place, and uh, that would be just a great delight. They're not angels, though. And so as, uh, as, a, as pastor's kids, they're, they're kind of, unfortunately, they're held to a, a different level of expectation, aren't they? Uh, you're supposed to look at the pastor's kids and, and uh, you're supposed to see pastoral quality in them. And, uh, and they see, anybody who knows my kids knows that they definitely are my children. And uh, it's not because the good qualities, it's the goofy ones that probably are the identifiers. But, but, uh, but they're not angels. And uh, we're oftentimes in a situation where I look at my children and, and uh, we go into a, a certain situation, being the pastor and the pastor's wife and the pastor's kids, and, and, I, and I look at them and I say, be on your best, say it with me, behavior. behavior. Be on your best behavior. And sometimes uh, I, I have actually uh, talked to my wife about this and I said, why is it that there are certain situations where we want our kids to be on their best behavior. Uh, is it or is it not true that my children should be on their best, say it with me, behavior. behavior all the time? Now, I'm pretty passionate about this because I realize that we fall into a category where we are not always, as Christians, on our best behavior. And, and for some reason, for some reason, the church as a whole has decided that there are, there's a, a time and a place to act Christian. That there are certain situations maybe where, where Christian uh, characteristics should shine. When we come to church, we are on our best, say it with me, behavior. behavior. What happens when we leave this place? What happens when we get into our car? What about the things that we say? Do we feel confident we can say them all the time to anyone in any place? What about the things that we watch? Are they always God-honoring? Are we always on our best behavior? Is it the things we listen to or, or the... Uh, all of these things, our mannerisms as a whole, do they exemplify Christ-like characteristics? Because I'm going to tell you something this morning, friends, is God does not care where you're at. There is no difference between the sacred and the secular to God. When we go into our car, when we go into our house, it ought to be the same as when we're here. And the church as a whole, not just this church, I'm saying the church as a whole, everybody in the world who is a professing Christian, I think struggles with this. It's getting harder and harder to identify a Christian. And it's a shame. Years ago, I was, uh, I was in northern Minnesota, and, uh, and I'd pull up to a, a stoplight. I was, a, I was a new Christian maybe a couple years, and I'd pull up to a stoplight, and and there's this car off onto the right. And, uh, and the music was just, just throbbing. And uh, I looked over there, there were four kids in the car, and, and uh, I'm not saying, if you guys have colored your hair and made it funny colors, that's up to you. I'm not here to con condemn that. Uh, but I mean, yeah, there's probably some, some interesting color of hair, and uh, there, was, there was all sorts of things about this car uh, I think about, uh, now I have tattoos, I'm not proud of it. I got my first tattoo when I was in seventh grade. Uh, that's not the unpardonable sin. I don't think Christians ought to go out and get tattoos, and that's just what I believe, okay? I believe that I can prove that uh, with the Bible. Here's what I am saying. 
is that you look over in this car with all the colored hair and the tattoos and, and all the piercings. And listen, friends, I'm not, I'm not attacking piercings. I, I think that they're wrong. I had my ear pierced when I was, in, when I, was I don't know, I was young. I never, thank God never had my eye or my lip or anything like that pierced. I'm not here to condemn them. Here's what I'm saying is that when I looked over into this car and that's what you see, you don't think Christian. You just don't think Christian. And so I was sitting there and I noticed on the, on the back of the car, it had such and such Christian college. And as the car drove away, I got to thinking to myself, oh, that is interesting. That just doesn't exude the behavior that we, would, uh, uh, that we would assume that a Christian would exude. We would, it just is, it was, it was almost a, it was interesting to me. I said, that's just not what I, what I, would, what I would think as a Christian. Because Christians are getting harder and harder to identify. And the world that they, the world that they are, are trying to be like is the same world that we're trying to get them to be like us. We are trying to get, get the world to say, I want what the Christians have. But why would the world, why would a non-Christian want what a Christian has when they have it? They're not going to want it. They're not going to want the music because they have it. They're not going to want the lifestyle because they have it, because so many Christians look so much like the world. And I'm saying that as a Christian, there are some behaviors that we should exemplify in our lives. There's a pattern. When you look at Scripture, you see certain things stick out at you. And I want to read a couple verses, so open your Bibles to Romans chapter 6 if you're not there already. And let's look at verses 1 to 4. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. And like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. We should walk in newness of life. There should be something different. Just as Christ died for sin, he was buried and came back new and had a new life. When we trust Christ as our Savior, he made the payment for sin. We should have a new life, and we should walk in newness of life. That word walk just simply means live. <coughs> that we should live a new life. Ephesians 4, 24 says, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. That you put on the new man. There should be something new. That you should live a life that is new. Colossians 3, 8 to 10 says, but now ye also put off all these Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. Now that's interesting. We should put off all of the things that the world is so excited about. Put all those things off and live a new life. Walk in newness of life. There should be something different as a Christian. Now, I use the word should because this is not talking about Christian salvation. This is talking about Christian service. This doesn't happen automatically as a Christian. I wish it would. There are some churches, there are some people that say, uh, if you're not living a good life, you're not saved, and that's just not true. A person is saved because they've placed their faith in Christ alone as their Savior. Not because they've lived a good life or they've turned from their sin or, or they've been baptized or given money. A person is saved when they trust Christ as their Savior. They believe he died, was buried, and rose again. They believe he's the Son of God and he atoned for their sins. That's salvation. Christian service is a whole other thing. 
These verses are not telling us how to be saved, but how to behave when we are saved. What is the behavior of the believer? If you look back at Romans 6, verse 4, even so we also should walk in newness of life. We should live a different life. How is the world ever going to want what we have when they already have it? They look at us and say, man, they, 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 they gripe, they gossip, they flirt, they commit adultery. They have broken families and divorces and all that stuff. And I'm not saying, if you've gone through that, I'm sorry. I'm not here to attack that. I'm saying that, that as a, as as a non-Christian, how is the non-Christian going to want what the Christian has if they already have it? We should walk in newness of life where they say, now that's a Christian. That's a forgiving soul right there. That's a guy who is able to not pass judgment, is able to be kind, be gracious, put off all these things, and it gives this nice list. It's just some of those things we should put off. But put on the new man. We should be something different. So I've given you three simple things here this morning, and I'm not gonna run over, so I'm gonna get with this. First of all, walk in love. Walk in love. And that simply means to live in love. And we get that from Ephesians 5.2. Verse 1 says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. We should walk in love. We should, we should have a characteristic a lifestyle of love. You know, the, the world lacks this kind of love. And if we lack this kind of love, why would they want what we have? They don't love. We don't love. What's the difference? Loving the way God does begins by knowing the way God loves. We, have to, we should be experiencing that for ourselves. And it's difficult to show others the love of God if you haven't seen it for yourself. So we need to examine what is God's love and how, how wonderful is it that your heavenly Father loves you. And it's that kind of love that we should walk in. This should be part of our new life. There is a, a hymn that, uh, I don't know if it's on your verse sheets or not, but it goes something like this. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. It goes on to say this, Could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade? So what it's saying, a scribe was somebody who copied. He was a copyist. If you had every person on earth a copyist, if every stalk was a quill and, uh, and the ocean was, was, was the ink and, this, and the, the, the sky was, was made of parchment, it says this, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. It would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. The significance of God's love in our life should impact us. And it should impact us in a way that we live differently, not like the world. And friends, I'm here to tell you that, we, that oftentimes we don't live differently than the world. And it's getting harder to recognize a Christian because they don't love the way that God loves. Now, I'm not saying I don't struggle with this because I do. We're not to love the way the world loves, but we're to love the way that God loves. In just a a quick search, the word love is mentioned hundreds of times in the Bible. And it's neat to see the variety of applications and how many of those applications deal with God's love for mankind. And it would behoove us to study it, to learn it, to memorize it, because we are to walk, Ephesians 5, to walk in love as Christ also hath loved us. And I tell you what, when people look at Christians, they ought to say, boy, those Christians, man, those husbands, they love their wives. 
Because that's what the Bible says. And those wives, man, they, they love their husbands, and the parents, they love their children's. It says for the brethren to love the brethren, and it says for us to love our enemies. And they had to look at that and say, that's a Christian right there. The love of that man is, is just like the love of God. But we're no different than them at times. And the behaviors of the believers are no good. So we need to walk in love. We also, secondly, need to walk in the light. We need to walk in the light. And this has to deal with, this has to deal with fellowship. 1 John 1, 7 says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. This is the fellowship. Fellowship has everything to do with like-mindedness. It means agreement. You are in agreement with God. If you want to fellowship with God, friends, if you want to fellowship with God, you have to be in agreement with him. You have to be in agreement with him primarily on the, fact that, uh, on the facts of his son. If you don't agree that Jesus is his son, that he came to this earth to die on the cross for our sin, you're not going to begin your fellowship with God. So we need to be in agreement with God about, with God about we need to be in agreement with him about our sin. And this is always the toughest one, isn't it? Because oftentimes we say, but that is just, uh, that's your opinion, Pastor. That's just your opinion. Is that really in the Bible? And I might say, you know what? That, those, that phrase is not in the Bible, but the principle is there. I can prove a lot of things because of the principle of God's word. This is how we have fellowship with him. We agree with him about his son, and we agree with him about our sin. And this sin, this sin separates us, in a sense, from God's fellowship. Not, not, not sonship, but fellowship. The difference. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, you're always going to be saved. No different than my kids, they're always going to be my kids. But when they sin, they've broken fellowship. Not sonship, they'll always be my kids. So kind of underneath this walk in the light, we're supposed to also walk as children of light. This is really neat. Walk as children of light. Ephesians 5.8 says, For you were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. So we need to walk as children of light. We need to walk in light of our, that's live, live in light of our relationship that we have with God. Isn't that so cool? That you are children of God? The Bible says, To as many as believe him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. That's just wonderful. To as many as believe in him. And, and, and we need to live our lives in light of the fact that we are children of God. You know that the prince lives his life differently than, 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 the, than the normal people because he is heir to the throne. The president's children live differently. They get to go into the White House. I don't have a White House. My house is taupe. But you know what I mean. They get to go into the White House. I mean, I mean, can you imagine saying, my daddy is the president? I don't think he says it like that. That's my kid says, my, my dad's the president. Dad, because see, he even thinks it's cute. Isn't that funny? We need to live our lives differently because of whose children we are. Walk as children of light. Live as children of the king. You're sons of God. You're children of God. Romans 13, 13 says, Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy. Don't live the way the world lives. The Bible says to come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Come out from among them. In Romans 12, we looked a little bit in our Sunday school hour, Romans 12 says, and be not conformed to the world, but be transformed. There's a difference. And what happens is Christians are looking so much like the world that the world doesn't want Christians. You look at them and say, I got what they have. They got all the same problems, and you know what we do? 
But are we walking as children of the light? Are we walking like the world walks? Are we living the way the world lives? But let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and in envying. And brothers, if we're striving with our brothers and sisters, if we're envying, if we're in the middle of this drunkenness and rioting and all of these things, if we are so excited about what the world has, we just look just like him. And there are absolute behaviors that the Christian ought to live. There's, there's a way the Christian should live in their lives. And we should walk in the light. Thirdly, we need to walk in his likeness. So walk in love, walk in the light, and walk in his likeness. 1 John 2, 6 says, He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. If we say we're a Christian, if we say we are abiding in him, then we ought to live as Christ lived. Live as Christ lived. Now this is, this, this is, this is a big topic, and I'm just going to give you a handful of bullet points real quick and help you to understand a little bit about the way that Christ lived and how we ought to live. We ought to live like him. Live like him. Here's what he says. He says, uh, uh, first of all, that he lived uh, obedient to his father, in John 6, uh, 38, For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. We need to do the will of God. O be obedient to God the Father. He also served others, which is very, tr- very difficult for a Christian, unfortunately, to do. But if we're to walk in his likeness, we ought to do what he did, right? And he served others. John 13, 14. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash other, one another's feet. Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. The way we live in his likeness is to do the things that he did. And he was a servant. And he was a servant. And I look around and I'll be honest with you, I see a lot of servants. I do. I see a lot of servants. Norm, you mowed the lawn. You spent five hours out there in the heat the other day. Thank you, servant. Max, he's out there oftentimes. Help me do all sorts of things. Others who are just always chipping in, working. This is how we live in his likeness, how we walk in his likeness. He also suffered. This is one we don't like to talk about. Uh, he was a man of sorrows, and he was acquainted with grief. In Isaiah 53, 3, he, was, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. He suffered. He was humble. Philippians 2, 8, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He was rejected by his own. That's a big one. I think there's a lot of Christians who don't want to be rejected by their own. A lot of people uh, are, are Christians and, and, and they, don't wanna make, they don't wanna make the sacrifice it takes to do what Christians ought to do. They don't wanna, they, they, they wanna kinda blend back into the world. They wanna be just like the group that God saved them from. And that's a real tragedy that we, that we intentionally just kind of stay where we're at and we, we become complacent over here because we don't want to suffer and we don't want to be humbled and we don't want to serve. And we certainly don't want to be rejected by our own. So we're all, we're, all, we just, we're, we're kind of complacent over here and, and this is the normal Christian life. It's unfortunate that this is the normal Christian life. And whatever happened to come out from among them and be separate. Don't be conformed to them. Let them conform to us. I say this passionately because it's a burden on my heart. And I see what happens is Christianity just blends into the world and they look just like them. And it's like, well, I don't even know. I mean, you just have this. I mean, listen, being saved is just trusting Christ. But being a disciple is following him. It's doing the things that you ought to do. We certainly don't want to be rejected by our own. 
I read a quote a while back in a book, and it said something like this, that oftentimes walking with God requires walking alone. And you know what? The world doesn't like what we have because primarily because we look just like them. We act just like them. Our behavior, our speech, our entertainment. How many times have you been around a group of people and somebody makes a, a wise joke and it's crude? It's, it's, not, even cl- it's not even a clean joke and you, and you laugh and smile at it. Sometimes you just got to be straight-faced like this. Maybe not quite like that. They'll say, I don't want to be like this guy. <laughs> I tell you what, there's, there's, there's a lot of crude humor out there that we just got to say, man, I'm turning this garbage off. I'm not preaching against TV, but a lot of what TV has is garbage. It's just true. And I have a TV in my house. I don't turn it on very often. Very, very rarely do I turn it on. But the smartphones, the phones, you get just as bad. I mean, it's just as wicked and, and I mean, all sorts of, there's nothing good that comes from Facebook except finding of more. I mean, it's, but <laughs> there is something good, I guess. I, I guess every illustration breaks down, but. He was rejected, he was humbled, he suffered, served others, lived obedient to the Father. You know, it's interesting. When I was in college years ago, they said, uh, the, the pastor said, living the Christian life is easy. And I thought, well, that's crazy. It's not easy. But truly, it actually is easy. It's just yielding to God. It's obeying every impulse of the Spirit. It's submitting yourselves to Him. I would rather have a small church that resembled Christ than to have a big church that didn't. I want a church which the Word is it's a called out assembly on a, on, a, on a macro level. I want a church that it looks like the Lord, that loves others, that serves others, a humble group of God-fearing, God-obeying, suffering individuals who love the Lord Jesus Christ with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. There's nothing that pleases me more than that. We need to live as Christ lives in us. That's the easy answer. And we all don't do it all the time, do we? I know I don't. I know you thought your pastor's perfect, but he's not. We all struggle with this. And so we're all in on this thing together. And in conclusion, let me just say this. that if we're not different than the world, they'll never want us. You, you've, you've heard that, 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 uh, that adage, you always want what you can't have, right? Now, ironically, they can have it. But if I had a million dollars and you had, well, first of all, if I had a million dollars, well, anyway, it's a whole other story. <laughs> if I had a million dollars and Terry had a million dollars, why would he want my million dollars if he already has it? But now, if he doesn't have a million dollars, and he sees that I have it, if he sees the peace of God in my life, and the joy of the Lord, and the love for the saints, and a happy home, and just a, an overall spirit about me, and if he doesn't have it, he's going to want it. We need to live differently than the world. Being a Christian is easy. That's just simply believing that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. He was buried, that he rose again the third day. That's salvation. You know, last night I was with this, uh, I was with this guy, and Dana and I were over there. And uh, you know me, I, I've got to try to sneak in the gospel somewhere. And so, sure enough, we're sitting at his table and. I don't remember what she said, and I said, you know, here's us right here. And I, I had my phone out. I didn't, have my, I didn't have my wallet on me. And uh, I said, right here, I said, this hand is you and me. I said, this, this phone is sin. In this case, this wallet is sin. And God loves us, hates our sin. 
The Bible says that we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I told this guy, I said, uh, and, and he was a Catholic guy, and I said, I'm not, you know, this is just, I grew up Roman Catholic, and I said, the Catholic Church. I said, and again, I'm not against the Catholic Church, I'm just saying this is what they believe, which is contrary to what, what the Bible says. I said, I said the, the, the Catholic Church says that, you know, baptism, infant baptism saves you. And uh, they say that giving money to the church saves you. They say that, uh, that doing good works is how we're able to redeem ourselves. But that's not what the Bible says. And, and, and you know, in love, I just say that. I'm not against Catholic people. I'm just simply saying that it's contrary to Scripture. I said the Bible says that the wages of this sin is death. The wages isn't church membership. It's not walking an aisle or praying a prayer or giving money. It's not infant baptism. The wages of this sin is death. Someone has to die for that. That's what the wage is. The payment is death. And I told this, this family, this Catholic family, I said, right here, I want this hand to represent you and me. Jesus Christ came to watch this die. Isn't that neat? He died because what was required was death. He died on the cross for our sin. I did that. Revival broke out. Everybody got saved. No, it didn't. I wish it would have, though. Here's what happened. I was able to give him the gospel. And I was able to tell him that it's not you and what you can do for the Lord. It's what the Lord did for you. And uh, I just want to share that with you this morning. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, if you believe that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, that he came to this earth and died, was buried and rose again the third day, God promises you eternal life. The Bible says it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saves us. He saves me. I can identify a little bit with Paul where he says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? I'm a sinner just like you are. And you're a sinner just like me. And the wages of sin is death. It's when we place our faith in Jesus Christ alone as our Savior alone. His shed blood made the payment that we couldn't make. If we try to, we're going to spend an eternity separated from God forever. And if you haven't done that today, if you haven't trusted Christ as your Savior, I beg of you to do that. The Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith. Faith in who? Faith in Christ. And that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works. It's not of turning from sin, living a good life. It's when you trust him to save your soul that you'll be saved.